Uh, hello, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I thank you very much for rushing through your lunch in record speed. I think you've got us back on track. My name's Mark Gainsborough. I look after a number of Shell's marketing businesses globally. I'm based here in Singapore. And I work very closely with Shell's integrated gas business, which, which is also based here in Singapore. It's my uh, pleasure today to be able to uh, invite our keynote uh, uh, speaker uh, today. Uh, Maria van der Haven uh, took over as executive director of the IEA in September 2011. And uh, previously, Maria had served as the Minister of Economic Affairs of the Netherlands from 2007 to October 2010. And in addition, she also served as Minister of Education and Science uh, previously to that. So a very, very experienced uh, minister and now executive director of the IEA, a very important institution. Um, uh, Maria is a very a fierce supporter of market principles. I'm sure we'll hear a bit about that later on. And it's her personal conviction that policy and business should work together to rend render energy production comprehensively more efficient and cleaner by improving energy efficiency, developing and using renewables, and producing and using energy otherwise generated in the cleanest possible way and the most cost-effective way. And at the same time, she's committed to the original and overarching mission of the IEA to produce and promote energy security. So uh, I please uh, join me in welcoming Maria onto the stage. Good afternoon, dear ministers, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much, Mark, for your kind introduction. And, you know, it's always a pleasure to be here in, at Singapore Energy Week, and I'm very glad that I can be with you once again. Now, this event is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to bring together people from across the globe to discuss some of the most important issues facing our countries and the world. And it's also an opportunity for us all to connect. And indeed, we are all part of a new world of social and economic connections. The rise of the internet, advances in transportation, and an increasingly global economy have made this world feel progressively smaller. And in many ways, the 21st century can be defined by how and why we connect. However, such connections come at a price. For every mobile phone that is charged and every intercontinental flight taken, there's energy demand. For every shipment of raw materials, parts, and final products in a global supply chain, there's energy demand. And for every child in an emerging economy who is studying late into the night under the glow of a new electric light, hoping to travel the world and attend university, there's energy demand. And this is not something we can get away from. While there are more and more options for increasing efficiencies, our global thirst for energy is inevitably going to rise. So how we work together to handle that demand will show the true strength of our connections. And fortunately, we are in a position to share, share information. And each of you in this room has a means to connect to almost anyone in the world instantly. This was unthinkable just one generation ago. From 1990 to 2013, internet users increased from 3 million all the way to 2.7 billion. And today there are more than 4.3 billion video-enabled devices connected to the internet. This is expected to double to 8.2 billion units by 2017. And without question, the ability to be connected 24 hours a day, seven days a week, is revolutionizing our society. And at last count, there are over 14 billion network connected devices worldwide. But again, this all comes at a cost. 
In 2013, network-enabled devices used more than 615 terawatt hours. And that's more, Mr. Birnbaum, than the electricity production of Germany. And as economies in emerging markets grow, these demands for connectivity, appliances, transportation, and other hallmarks of modern life will grow in turn. There's no turning back. So, can we reconcile this growth with the financial, social, and environmental costs of energy? Is it possible to increasingly connect our economies and societies while maintaining energy security and meeting climate goals? And where will the major challenges take place in the coming years? Here in Southeast Asia, demand for energy will continue to rise over the foreseeable future. Electricity demand increased by a factor of five between 1990 and 2011. Yet it remains low. Growth will continue. And access to electricity varies greatly across the region from near universal access in Malaysia, Thailand, here in Singapore, to below 50% in Cambodia and Myanmar. Meeting some of these demands can be made more efficient through realization of the ASEAN power grid. And the existing interconnections in the greater Mekong sub-region have a capacity near four gigawatts. And plans are in place to develop 30 new interconnections over the coming decade with transmission capacity of 19 gigawatts. And as I saw firsthand on my recent trip to Laos, hydro is a significant contributor in the region. And these interconnections can increasingly take advantage of this source of energy. However, I know, care must be taken when sharing such a valuable resource. And just as regional cooperation can build interconnections, regional cooperation can help to ensure the sustainable use of water. And similarly, working together will be key to ensuring that power interconnections from the basis form the basis of a transparent and effective open electricity market. But you know, this is not the only region that faces the challenge of growing demand. In India, over 200 million people remain without access to electricity. So steps are being taken to build connections and ready the system for this coming demand. In January 2014, India connected a sudden grid to the other four regions, completing a, a national grid. And despite remaining challenges with transmission and distribution losses, this is a substantial achievement, facilitating better management of demand and ensuring stability, stability. And on top of this achievement, the potential for cross-border connections with Bhutan, Bangladesh, Myanmar, and Sri Lanka represent opportunities for India. However, the economic, environmental, and energy security implications of such interconnections depend on the sustainable growth of the domestic system itself, supported by predictable policy. And these kinds of strong interconnected systems will be helpful in diversifying the energy mix. Not only Southeast Asia and India, but all emerging economies with such fast demand with, with such fast growing demand will compromise around 70% of new renewable generation to 2020. And in China, renewables are forecast to provide 45% of new generation to 2020, ahead of coal. Combined with the rise in nuclear power, low carbon generation will account for the majority of growth in China over the next five years. Now, two-thirds of new power generation in China last year came from renewable energy in the form of solar, wind, and hydro. And in India, three-quarters of power projects announced over the last three months have been for renewable energy plants. And this shift to renewables is essential if we are to limit average global temperature rise to two degrees Celsius. And that is what IEA refers to as the 2 ds scenario. And this is an aspirational scenario. It's what the world could look like if we all take serious concerted action. 
And in fact, this scenario would require a share reversal in electricity generation, with renewables making up 65% of generation, power generation in 2050. Meeting such a goal, well, it requires commitment, global commitment. And here in Asia, we are seeing real progress. Taking advantage of growing demand and investment opportunities can enable emerging economies and developing countries to avoid the difficult position facing OECD countries today. Because there we see, we see stagnating demands and we see aging infrastructure that makes climate targets seem a distant hope. And indeed, despite all the advances in the deployment of non-fossil generation, globally, globally we are still going in the wrong direction. And this is thanks largely to the unrelenting and concurrent rise in unabated coal use in electricity generation. Since 2010, the growth in generation from coal has been greater than that of all non-fossil sources of power generation combined, continuing a 20-year trend. And even the recent US development of switching from coal to gas has stalled, at least temporarily. And coal use in the European Union rose by 1.5% in 2012 over 2011. Now, what I mentioned is 2DS2 decrease trajectory requires a sharp decline in coal use in parallel with rapid development of carbon capture and storage, or CCS. And instead, coal is still the dominant future, the dominant energy fuel, and aside from a notable exception in Canada, 2013 saw very few major positive developments on CCS. In all countries, whether they be in Europe, in Asia, or elsewhere, it is essential that coal plants use high efficiency, supercritical designs, and that more and more make use of CCS. Meeting global climate goals will simply not be possible otherwise. And of course, we can't talk about energy connectivity and security without talking about gas. In Southeast Asia, the region's traditional exporters are experiencing declines in domestic gas production that saw Indonesia and Malaysia the major LNG exporters turning to LNG imports to cater for their respective domestic demand. And that's a demand that is increasing across the region due to rapid economic growth. And while ASEAN has been supporting interconnection pipelines in the region due to geographic limitations and the need for political coordination, it is unrealist unrealistic to see pipelines developing more rapidly than LNG facilities. And this shift will be challenging. And there is one thing that Asia cannot count on. Cheap, abundant gas unleashed by the shale gas revolution. Don't count on that. And while some North American LNG will cross the Pacific, oh yes, and probably sooner than later, it will not be enough to supply the entire region and it will be expensive. Now, Asia has two ways to avoid competing at top price for natural gas. Find more of it and use less of it. Now, the good news is that both of these solutions are possible. The IEA estimates that the Asia-Pacific region has almost 10% of the world's conventional gas reserve. And even before tapping significant unconventional supplies, these conventional reserves are enough to meet more than 40 years of what Asia may need in 2035. But we know, of course, Asia-Pacific is a massive region, and it's not realistic to, to expect all of that gas to be tapped or being used exclusively at home. And there is simply no scenario where Asia becomes self-sufficient in gas. However, if the region exploits its reserves carefully, and takes simple steps to limit growth in energy demand, it can slow the growth of its dependence on imports. However, getting more gas out of the ground will require government policy that creates efficient gas markets across the region. And in terms of using less, this is something again that concerns all regions because the most valuable energy is the energy that isn't used at all. And of course, now I'm talking about that hidden fuel 
energy efficiency. Now, more and more economists are realizing that energy efficiency isn't a burden, but rather an opportunity, a connection. It's the connection between efficiency and growth that is clear. And this is the case not simply in established economies, but also in developing and in emerging economies across the globe. Now, over the last decade, Southeast Asia has matched energy intensity improvements made by OECD countries. And among other factors, this reflects shifts from inefficient traditional fuels to modern fuels and increased urbanization. However, there is room for improvement as Asia currently consumes more energy per unit of GDP than the OECD average. And the savings from these improvements can be significant. In fact, our, our most recent energy efficiency market report shows that the savings from energy efficiency improvements and investments in 11 IEA countries where we have cons consistent data were larger than total final consumption in the EU. And this means that in 2011, long-term improvements and investments in energy efficiency in IEA countries serve to reduce from the global energy system the equivalent of the energy consumption of a major economy. Now, along these lines, the IEA has been working with regional partners in Southeast Asia to, to develop a series of recommendations for energy efficiency, ranging from minimum energy performance standards for buildings and appliances, to the establishment of energy efficiency data collection and indicators. And we look forward to continuing this conversation. So we have looked into economics for the consumer side, to use energy more efficiently, so to use less. We looked into the economics of efficient generation, transport and distribution. So, and this is an open question, what about future business models for utilities? Now, without these improvements in efficiency, the energy system will be significantly more strained than it is today in providing energy, security, and economic opportunities to the global population. And the payoff for these building, for building these, connect these connections is economic growth, it's energy security, it's environmental sustainability, and that those are the three E's of the IEA's mandate. However, here you see a fourth, and it's the fourth E that underscores why we are here today, and that is engagement, engagement on a regional and global scale. And these four principles should form the basis of a 21st century energy system. And this 21st energy system is a system that features global trade, open markets, regional power grids. It's a system that features distributed and more central power generation, both fossil-based and renewables, nuclear, increased consumer engagement and demand-side management, utility-scale storage technologies, electrified transport, and centralized power and heat generation. It's a system where all of the elements are integrated to optimize investment and operation. And I know, while this increases complexity, the gains in efficiency and resilience are tremendous. It's a system that optimizes the use of energy resources. It's not something that will happen overnight, whether across IEA countries or emerging economies. And it will require a continued focus on, again, building connections connections in terms of infrastructure, markets, policies. And none of this will be easy. However, the benefits from working together and building these connections are significant. And in my view, we would be wise to take advantage. You know, dear friends, we all have our role to play in this 21st century energy system. And we can only make it work in being connected and working together because this will require technology, it will require investment, it will require industry, it will require policy, but most of all, it will require the will, of, the will and brains of humanity. Thank you very much. Th thank you very much, Maria, for that very comprehensive and uh, clear presentation. And uh, well, that was the easy bit. Now we've got you in the hot seat for some, uh, some questions. And uh, one of my uh, privileges here is to get to ask the first one. For those of you 
in the audience, you're very welcome to pose your questions using pigeonhole, or uh, we'll take some questions from the room a little bit uh, later on. Um, but Maria, I wanted to ask you first of all, you launched the, the IEA launched the Southeast Asia Energy Outlook exactly a year ago. What are the main things that have changed since then? One of the things that has been changing is, is the, well, one of the things that has not been changing is the enormous growth in energy demand. That's still there. But one of the things that has been changing are developments, for instance, in the, in the gas market. What we have seen is that for the moment the oil price went down, so that means that the connection of the gas price to the oil price is now in a more positive, is now in a more positive situation, but that will not continue forever. So let's not be complacent about that and see how we can develop, develop this, this gas market in Southeast Asia in a more sustainable way. And of course that will need new gas. And I think new gas will be coming, not only from the United States, but also from new supplies, like uh, there is Australia, there is, of course, the, uh, the, there is, of course, Africa with new supplies. But at the same time, it will require a market conditions that are not yet there. So much more work needs to be done. What has changed furthermore? I think the, the focus on energy efficiency is changing. I think the focus on how to phase out fossil fuel subsidies is changing because all governments are aware this is a burden to your financial to your financial position and actually if you continue to have these fossil fuel subsidies it is the enemy of energy efficiency and this awareness i can see it quite clear it's growing all all over the region and the last thing i would like to mention i think what asean is doing it's very important, Go, growing into a market situation that will be more integrated also from a general point of view. And this awareness is growing very strongly. Thanks. You, you mentioned the, uh, uh, the need to uh, re reduce fossil fuel subsidies. What do you think the different players in the energy sector can do to help that process? That's a very difficult situation. And as we can see in countries, there is always a group of people that are very much affected in, 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 a, in a very serious way. And those, those are the ones who are really in need of the, the subsidies because they can't pay for it, they can't afford it. So at the same time, what we can see is that a number of, well, because they are general subsidies, people like you and me, or like you, we are all, well, we are profiting from these subsidies, but we are not the ones they are for, they are meant for. So how to find a reasonable way to get out of that situation? One of the things is that there should be an awareness that, energy, that these fossil fuel subsidies are really the enemy of energy efficiency. And if you want to meet your growth in energy demand, you have to use your energy more efficiently. Very important is that you bring together all, all stakeholders. And we have seen that, for instance, in countries like Indonesia, in Malaysia, in Thailand, a number of well, very significant examples have been taken. So it, it is possible. And the most important thing is that if you don't do it, if you don't do it, then your fossil fuel subsidies remain a significant factor distorting your energy market. But bringing together all stakeholders is absolutely needed. And you know, it's, it's, it's political. It's political. It needs, the, um, it needs not only the support from government, but it needs a real policy to do it. I know that's difficult. I've been a minister for quite some years, and I know how difficult that is. So engaging all stakeholders and see to it that you do it in a transparent way and see to it that you have a targeted approach to those who cannot afford the energy, that is absolutely necessary. One of the uh, other things that you talked about was the development of the gas market in Asia. And our previous panel before lunch, there was talk of the, uh, what it takes to develop a, a gas hub, an LNG hub uh, in this part of the world. Where, where does the IEA think the conditions would be right for the development of that sort of gas hub? Ah, well, let me talk about the conditions first. <laughs> well, one of the conditions, well, one of the first conditions is that you have additional gas. That's one of the conditions. And the other condition is to, that, you have a, that you have a physical market as well. So you need to have storage facilities, you, ha you need to have a, 
uh, you need to have liquefaction, you need, you need to have regasification, you need all these facilities you need to have in place. That's one thing. The other thing is you need to see to it that you decouple a number of things, transport from other, from other commercial activities. You need, um, you need to have a regulatory framework. You need to have a, a, a government that is really not hands-on, but more hands-off and taking a position of regulator and arbiter, uh, in, in arbitrage. And then when you look across the region, well, there, is a diff there are differences, of course. In our view, there are a few countries that are ahead. One of them is Singapore. That's true, one of them is Singapore. But as I mentioned to, to the minister this morning, will it only be Singapore? I don't think so. There will be more. Southeast Asia is very big, and there's a huge demand of gas. But it will be very important to to see how you can speed up the conditions to really see to it that this um, gas hub is going to be developed. And of course, then some other countries are quite concerned about this. Australia doesn't like it because, well, everything comes at a price. In our view, the situation will develop more into what we can see in Europe, a more hybrid situation where you have long-term contracts. They will always be there but where something is done about, for instance, the destination clauses, and at the same time you have spot, price, spot pricing. And these two together will see to it that the uh, um, Southeast Asian gas market will be more transparent, more flexible than it is now. And in our view, that is absolutely necessary. But it's not only in our view, it's I think also in the Southeast Asian countries' view that's absolutely necessary. Very good. I'm going to go to one of the questions that's come through the power of the web via pigeonhole. Uh, the question is, is coal really bad? It's a cheap way to increase access to energy for the poorest. Well, that has, that, that's true. It is a very cheap way of giving access to the poorest. And in some countries, it has had that function. That's true as well. What I would like to answer your question with, with, with two other additional remarks. One is that we do not believe that the world will be out of coal in the next 50 years. No, definitely not. It's cheap, it's abundant, and it's not a political issue. The other thing is, is it necessary that the world keeps on burning coal in the way it's burning coal now? And that's what bring, that is what brings me to my, to, to my remark about the, uh, the need to share uh, technology to use, how shall I put it, to see to it that coal-fired power plants used supercritical technology and not the subcritical technology. That's one thing. And there are more issues that have to do with cleaner coal than there are now. Look at what's happening at CCS. But on the other hand, I am not going to say that the world will be out of coal. Some others are saying that. I don't believe that maybe in 200 years' time, but not within the next 50 years. So it's also, I think, a, a, a pledge to all our uh, coal companies to see to it that you use your coal in a more sustainable way than it has been done now in many countries. So there's a very clear technology dimension there. There's a very clear technology dimension there, and it's also, I know that that technology is not always cheap, so that means that those who have the opportunity, the possibility to power, to see, to talk about the export credits, that they see to it that this technology is being made available to those countries who, are, who need it most. And that's not only in, in, in Southeast Asia, it's not only in China, it's not only in India, it's also in Africa. So the follow-on question is, is one also from the web. What policy incentives can be implemented to encourage countries in this shift away from coal? or to use cleaner coal technologies? It depends on what countries you're talking about. Because when we are talking about the rich countries, there it's one of the things that, that could be done is just to regulate it in a way that there is a shift to other, maybe maybe even, well, maybe competitive, yeah, no, no, to other competitive, to other competitive fuels. When you don't have that opportunity, it's much more difficult. One of the things that is important is see to it that you have a ceiling on your emissions. And that's something that could be done in almost all countries, and it would encourage the use of a different technology. The other thing, of course, is that when you want to look into um, uh, 
low carbon options to provide electricity. Well, we have been talking about nuclear this morning, and nuclear comes, comes back on stage. And in our view, and in all our um, uh, scenarios, nuclear is part of the, uh, is part of the uh, global energy mix, even making up for 17% of um, electricity in 2050. And although some countries are phasing out nuclear, others won't do that, and maybe even invest in nuclear. So this is another thing, and then of course there's renewables and energy efficiency. So you talked about the importance of engagement, and clearly institutional capacity is very important in making policy changes. One of the other questions we had from the web was, does Asia need its own IEA equivalent? Well, <laughs> why not? But if you want to join us, you know, that's a problem, you know, because then the countries have to be a member of the OECD first, and that's something I cannot change. But of course, the member country of IEA could change that. But I think it's important, because we don't have that now, that we cooperate where we can. And that is what we have been doing uh, with the ASEAN countries, but also with China and with India. Because in my view, um, you know, the IEA mission in, in 1974 was to take care of the energy security situation of its members. And what we have seen in the past 40 years, that energy is a global issue, it's a global challenge. And you cannot take care of the energy security of 28 countries without taking into account what's happening in the rest of the world. You know, in 1974, these 28, they used three quarters of oil, of oil in, in, in every year. This, this situation is gone. It's now less than half. And in 20 years' time, it will be just one third. And this, this is not because the... Uh, the OECD countries are using less is because others are using more. And this is because they are emerging. They are emerging economies. They are growing economies. So we have to be very, very, how shall I put it, very realistic about that and take into account not only what's happening in other parts of the world, but where we can cooperate, where we can connect, do it. And that's why I'm here. So I know that you personally are very uh, positive about the role of renewables going forwards. One of the other questions we've had from the, from the web is, what are our options in terms of incentivizing the use of renewable energy without subsidies? There are already quite a few situations in, um, in the world where um, renewables don't use subsidies. For instance, in wind in Brazil, solar in, in some other parts. We have seen, have we seen hydro without subsidies. So it's not so that it's not possible without subsidies. But, and I think it was mentioned this morning as well, subsidies are something if you install them, then it's very difficult to get rid of them because sometimes they are going to be part of, of people's income. And that of course is something that is, is, it's not okay. So the point is that if you want to subsidize your renewables or your renewable, uh, the, 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 the growth of your renewables in your country, first of all, choose the renewables that you are abundant in. For instance, let me talk about the Netherlands, that's where I live. Well, there is some solar development, but we don't have enough solar. We do have enough wind, but not solar. So invest in wind. The other thing is see to it that there is a cap on your, on your subsidy. And if costs come down, and costs have come down, for instance, in, in, in solar, in solar, especially in photovoltaics, if costs come down, your subsidy has to go down. So that otherwise you won't get rid of it. And it was mentioned this morning as well, actually subsidizing renewables does not help innovation. Because if the costs are high, it's an incentive for, to innovate. So it's a very complicated situation, complicated situation. And let me give you one other example. It's in, in, in Japan where the feed-in tariffs are very generous. And well, we see now that we have, that Japan needs to, to do something about it because it comes at a cost. And so it's impossible, it's, it's, it's very important to see to it that at the end of the day, you don't have any subsidies on the renewables anymore. But it's not, it doesn't come easy, but without a flexibility in your feed-in tariffs, it's very difficult to get rid of them. And then there will be retroactive 
uh, actions, read reactive policies, which will destroy investors' investors' trust and confidence, which doesn't help at all. I'm going to give, uh, I know if some of you don't like asking your questions on the web and would rather ask by raising your hands, I would uh, welcome you to do that. Do we have any questions in the, in the room before I go back to the questions on the, on the web? Okay, I don't, I don't see a sea of hands, so think, think about that. I'll, I'll come back to the room in a, in a second. In the meantime, another one of the questions we had on the, coming through Pigeonhole, any uh, opinions on the possibilities of an international agreement on binding CO2 emissions? Do you want a frank answer? Frank answer, please. I don't believe it. It will be very, very difficult. It will be very difficult to achieve something like that in, uh, in Paris, and I'll just give you two reasons why I'm very pessimistic about it. I, I follow the, um, the developments in the United States. Up till now, the United States never had a binding, never agreed to a binding agreement or something like that, and China wasn't present in um, at the meeting in September in New York. So this is not very helpful. On the other hand, putting, putting the finger on the, on the sore spot is quite important, and I do hope that, well, some other more or less binding agreement could be, could be found. For instance, this phasing out of fossil fuels and subsidies. For instance, to put a, an end to, um, to flaring gas, which, to flaring methane. And another one is to stop use subcritical coal technology. These three things are, are, could be useful and could be, in my view, be very, very helpful. And of course, use in your energy more efficient than you did. And the interesting thing about energy efficiency is that it's, it doesn't come at a cost, but it's also a market. And we can see it developing now. New, new enterprises are starting up, new, new forms of um, Technology, uh, technology appliances, for instance, following the, the top runner program of Japan, things like that are helpful as well. But I hope that there will be a number of agreements that will bring our climate negotiations forward, not only in Paris, but let's, but let's start in Lima uh, later this year. Now, a core, a core part of the mis mission of the Ener International Energy Agency, of course, is around energy security. Um, and you talked about the importance of ASEAN working together. How do you think ASEAN can work together to improve energy security? What we heard this morning, for instance, about the, the, the Southeast Asian power grid, I think this is a very important one which will enhance energy security. The gas market is, is a very important one. And um, I think working together in energy efficiency, seeing to whether the ASEAN market is making use of the, the market it has because it's a huge market. And there I think the examples what we can see in, that we can see in the European market where because of this cooperation it was possible to have an open market also for, um, for new, new, uh, new developments that will be very helpful. So it's not only in the energy field that we're talking about, it's about the development of the Southeast Asian market as such. Can I go back and again chest with the room? Anybody has a burning question for Maria? This is your chance. We do have one over there. The subsidies of fuel in Indonesia killed the opportunity for federal tax to take over Indonesian generation, at least outside of the major islands like Java. So I, I've, it's a little puzzling to see the emphasis on subsidies to renewable energy when, of course, there are by far, far larger subsidies to fossil fuels, both directly and also indirectly through the lack of carbon pricing. What we can see at this moment that is that the, uh, the, the subsidies on fossil, for fossil fuels for end users, uh, that's what I'm talking about for end users, are about uh, five, more than 540, 540 billion US dollars a, a year. That's a lot of money and 51 billion US dollars are here in, in, in Southeast Asia. And when you compare that to the subsidies for renewables, it's more than, more than fifth times as much. So there is quite a difference between the two of them. But in general, you have to see to it that the, uh, that the phasing out of subsidies is done in such a way that you take into account the position of those who are really in need of it, and that's the poorer part of the population. At this moment, just 8% of the money that I was mentioning goes to that part of the population, and the rest is for others. So there is something to gain there. 
And that's the difference with the subsidies for the renewables, where there is another thing to gain. But there again, if you could use that money to enhance, to enhance the use of renewables, maybe even to enhance the, the use of off-grid and mini-grid solutions to connect more people to electricity, that would be very, very helpful indeed and would solve quite some problems, not only in Indonesia, but also in other parts of the world. Do we have one more question from, from the room? Okay, looks like I'd like not. So I'll, I'll just take one more from the web. And uh, this was, we had the question about coal, the question about gas. Why should we shift to gas? <laughs> Two reasons. First of all, it is um, cleaner than coal, much cleaner than coal. And it's an excellent bridge and an excellent ally of renewables and will bring us into a more sustainable and cleaner energy future. Very good. Very well said. And uh, that's just uh, got us back onto, onto time. Maria, a big thanks for spending time with us today. Thank you for our, the presentation and thank you for answering our questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Gainsborough and Ms. Vanderhoven, for such an enriching session.